It's great to be here with you this evening. Really good to see you. Everybody all right? Yeah. Good, good, good. If you've got your Bible, you need to turn to Judges chapter 3. I am going to swear. I am going to need that. I can feel it already. Hey, it's really good to be here. I travelled down from Manchester this afternoon. I spent the day in the garden just doing really nearly nothing. It was great. And then my son said, let's go play tennis, Dad. You ever play tennis against a nine-year-old? It's brilliant. You win. It's just amazing. I absolutely mullered him for about the first 15 minutes and then he reminded me that he was my son and I was supposed to be teaching him, not killing him. So we readjusted and he in the end won everything. Uh, because that's just the way it's supposed to be. It's what you're supposed to do as a parent, how you're supposed to sacrifice. Cool. Every found Judges 3? Oh, okay, we need to address some stuff really early. Alright, number one is this. I'm aware it's a little warm in here. Aware of that. Number two, you have mouths and preaching is not a one-way thing, it's a two-way conversation. So your response becomes important. Because the better you respond, the better I get. And if you want me to preach better, you have to respond well. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, this side's okay. This side, man, there's just, that was like nothing then. So we should try that again. If I'm going to preach better, you've got to respond well. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, cool. You're really not happy about that, but you'll, you'll get over it. I mean, she just went, mm. I mean, she was like, white boy said, what? It was just like, just, just give me a look like, wow. That was, man, going there. If you want to go, I'll go there, but let's, don't make me go there. You don't want to make me go there. If I go there, it's going to get nasty in this place. Cool. Judges chapter 3. Uh, I have no boundaries right now. Anything could happen. I hope you're just ready for a sense of anything could happen. Just a sense that God wants to break into this room. He wants to speak to you. God wants to speak to you personally. He doesn't want to just speak to us corporately. He wants to talk to you personally. He wants to make an impact on your life. He could release his word into your life at any moment. The question is, are we ready to receive? No, no, no. Come on. Because if response indicates our readiness... One person somewhere in the middle here, that was you, is ready to receive. Are we ready to receive? Yeah. Oh, that, that's a little bit more the kind of response we're looking for. That's the kind of heart that I come to expect from being here with you guys at All or Nothing. I was here last year, that's what you like. So let's find out who we really are and get back to being it. Judges chapter 3. Uh, the book of Judges is just wild. The book of Judges is some of the most ridiculous scripture you can ever read. You read stories about people who do absolutely just ridiculous stuff, and chapter 3 is, in the list of ridiculous, the most ridiculous. If there's a story that should have been taken out of the Bible, this is probably it. It's probably it because really, it's all about hating fat people. That's what the story's about. We're going to read it in a moment, you're going to see it, and you're going to think, mm, is that what it's about? That is what it's about. So my title this evening is this. This is my title. It is time to kill the fat man. That's my title for the evening. It's time to kill the fat man. It's time to kill the fat man. Now a few things I need to tell you. Number one, I am not that fat man. It's not me. Number two, this has got nothing to do with darts players. Nothing to do with the game of darts whatsoever. And number three, it's not against dieting. It's nothing. Some of us are just big boned. It's not our fault. It's just, it's my mum's fault. She made me eat everything on the plate when I was a kid. And ever since, I've just not been able to stop. It's not my fault. Anyway, enough about that. Judges chapter 3. In Judges chapter 3, God's people are in a mess. Why is it that when you read the Bible, God's people one day are great, the next day they're in a mess? They just can't seem to get any consistency in their life. It's brilliant, it's bad, it's amazing, it's terrible. And then suddenly, in Judges chapter 3, it gets to about the worst it's ever been because they've been suffering with the same... You can put your hand down. They've been suffering with the same... If you need to go, it's at the back down the stairs. They've been suffering with the same problem for 18 years. They've been suffering with the same problem for 18 years and they have just had enough of this problem. But it takes them 18 years to decide to deal with the problem. So I want to ask you a question. What do you put up with in your life that you haven't asked God to help you deal with? Like what do you just put up with? Because it's, it's just part of your normal. 
just becomes something that you you said that's that's my life that's who I am that's what I'm about it's just it's just totally normal to you you look at you and one of the things that defines you is this thing it's who I am we have a kid in our church is He's about 14 years of age now, but he looks about eight because of the heart defect that he has. He's tiny, he's absolutely tiny. In his head, he's 14. In his body, he looks about eight. And his heart, he's only got a quarter of a heart. And any time that we come to a point of believing for a miracle, we come to a point of praying for the sick, I watched this 14-year-old kid who's been prayed for since before he was born get out of his chair, walk to the front, stick his hands in the air and go, God, would you move for me today? Now we all go, yeah, that makes sense. You should keep going. You should keep believing for a miracle. But how much other stuff do we just put up with in our lives? Well, that was my past. I have to live with that. That shaped me. So that's the way I am today. I'm, I'm going to be like that because that's what happened. Now, if you knew what I've been through, you wouldn't believe it. You need to meet my wife. My wife's amazing. I was called Julie. Uh, we, we met when I was, I was 18, 19, she was 19, 20. She's a little bit older than me. And uh, when she turned 40, I had a great time. I can't believe I'm 40. I can't believe I'm married to a 40 year old. That's terrible. It's just a disaster. I, I was 39 at the time. So, you know, I'm just, but, and she was 40. I just had to make the point clear to her. My wife, my wife is a, she's a counselor. And she's kind of, she sits in a room with people. And they, they don't want to tell her things. And then after about three minutes, they just start talking. They don't mean to. They've come in the room thinking, I'm saying nothing. I'm not letting you know anything about my life because I know you're okay. You're going to try and get it out of me. And she just sits there and looks at them. And after about three or four minutes, they just start to break. It's brilliant watching it. I sit in the room with her sometimes just to watch them fall apart. And she'll sit there and she'll go, so how are you doing? Yeah, I'm great. And she'll go, mm-hmm. And these grown men start to go, <laughs> no, it's all good. Really? Yes! It's fantastic! And then, then, then they start to talk about, like, this is what's wrong, there's this, and there's that, there's that, there's that, there's that. And I went to her, what did you do? She goes, nothing. I just asked them how they were. So I tried it. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Great. Okay, see you soon. Doesn't just, doesn't work the same way. It just has this gift, this ability to go, find what's wrong. We all have stuff that we put up with. Whereas we think about ourselves, where we think about other people, where we judge other people. Stuff we put up with that's physical, stuff we put up with that's emotional, stuff we just are, we put up with it. And then God says, really want to challenge you on this, and you go, on what? You don't need to challenge that, God, that's me. Don't challenge that, it's just who I am. And God's like, no, 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 I want to challenge you because I love you. So I'm not going to leave you the way you were when I arrived here tonight. I'm not going to leave you the way you were when you walked through the doors earlier. When you said, I'm just going to an event with my youth group. God's going, no, you've not just come to an event, you've actually come to meet me. You've come to have a moment, you've come to have an encounter, you've come to have a life-changing situation. The question is just whether you access that or not. And the question can only be answered by you. A, a band can't get you there. A preacher can't preach you there. You have to choose to go there. You have to make the decision. I'm going to let God speak to me. More than that, I'm going to let God change my life. I was 14 years of age. I was waiting at the bus stop at school, just waiting to go home after the end of another same day. When God spoke to me, which was rude, because at the time I was ignoring God. I've been going to church and then I just wanted to stop going to church, but I was too scared of my mum, so I kept going to church. I went to church in body, but my head was somewhere else. 14 years of age, stood at the bus stop ready to go home. When God speaks to me, I'm going, so God says, Stuart. I said, God, I'm ignoring you. That's rude to talk to someone who's ignoring you. God says, you're talking to me now. I thought, God. He's crafty. <laughs> he started talking to me and I talked back and now I'm talking to him. It's ridiculous. He said, let me talk to you about the rest of your life. I said, I just want to get the bus. I just want to go home and get some Rice Krispies. That's all I'm bothered about. Just, just get me home 
and a whole round chicken for dinner. That's all I am bothered about, God. And then suddenly God says, let me talk to you about the rest of your life. 14 years of age, from standing in the queue to getting on the bus, I knew what my life was about. I wasn't listening to God, but he knocked on the door and I opened it. And at that moment, I got a sense of destiny. Got a sense of purpose. Got a sense of direction. Mm -hmm. Know where I want to go. Know what I want to do. Know what I want to be a part of. Know the way I want to live. Know how I don't want to live. Know what I want to change. Know what I don't want to change. Know what's important to me. When you live with a sense of destiny, it brings a sense of purpose to everything you do. In Judges chapter 3, we meet someone who was put up with 18 years of being ruled by the enemy. 18 years of being told where to go and what to do. 18 years of not being able to control what they do with their finance. 18 years of not being able to control how they worship. 18 years of not being in control of their own lives. And then one of them decides, you know what, I'm going to do something about this. It doesn't say he sat down with everybody else and said, let's make a plan. It just says that he decided to do something about it. Judges chapter 3. Verse 15. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed man of the tribe of Benjamin. The Israelites sent Ehud to deliver their tribute money to King Eglon of Moab. Moab. King Eglon's the bad guy. Ehud made a double-edged dagger about a foot long, and he strapped it to his right thigh, keeping it hidden under his clothing. He brought the tribute money to Eglon, who was very fat. You know he was very fat because they bothered to write it down. I mean, and Jesus forgave me afterwards. <laughs> it says this, after delivering the payment, Ehud started home with those who'd helped carry the money. It's so much money, he's got help to carry it. This is serious business he's in now. When he reached the stone idols near Gilgal, he turned back, he came to Eglon and said, I have a secret message for you. So the king commanded his servants, be quiet. He sent them all out of the room and Ehud walked over to Eglon, who was sitting alone in a cool upstairs room. And Ehud said to him, I have a message from God for you. As Eglon rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, pulled out the dagger strapped to his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. The dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. You imagine the sucking noise. It's gone. It's just gone. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger. Well, you wouldn't, would you? I mean, you wouldn't think, I'm going to have a rummage in here and see what I can find. You, you wouldn't think, I'd just stick my hand into his belly and say, oh, what's that? Oh, chicken wing. Well, you know, you just, you, you're not going to do that. He left it there, and then he says, and the king's bowels emptied. Nice, nice description from the Bible. He who closed and locked the doors of the room and escaped down the latrine. For those who don't understand what that is, that's a way out of a building. After he was gone, the king's servant returned and found the doors in the upstairs room locked. They thought he might be using the latrine in the room. So they waited. I mean, how long do you wait for a king to finish going? How long? Is there a prescribed time? Are you taught that as a servant? We don't know. After a long delay, they became concerned and got a key. And when they opened the door, they found their master dead on the floor. And while they were waiting, Ehud escaped, passing the islands on his way. When he arrived in the hill country, he sounded a call to arms. He literally blew a trumpet, and then he led a band of Israelites down the hills, and they basically took back over. It's, it's one of those stories you read and go, man, why is that in the Bible? Do you ever read something and think, God, what could you possibly be teaching us through that? Really, what was the point of that? Some bits of Deuteronomy, I haven't got a clue. Why is that there? But here, it's here for this reason. It's time to act. It's time to act. It's time to stop putting up with what you've lived with. It's time to stop just coping with it and dealing with it. It's time to actually get a hold of it and go, you know what? I ain't putting up with this any longer. I'm not going to allow it to control me any longer. It's not going to decide when my money goes, when my worship goes. I am not putting up with this and I'll do whatever it takes. The problem for evil is this. The Bible tells
tells us that he was left-handed. Now, being left-handed today is not particularly an issue. I have three children. My middle one, whose name is Grace, Grace is left-handed. Both of her grandfathers are left-handed. The only issue is when they're teaching you to write, you can't see the word you're writing as you write it. That's about the only thing she's ever struggled with. But back in the Bible, this is a bad thing. It's a bad sign about your life. It, it tells us all sorts of stuff we don't want to talk about right now. But this is what we understand from the text. He wasn't just left-handed, his right hand was crippled. He didn't, wasn't just a left-handed man, his right hand was useless. He probably had a disease that had ruined his hand to the point where he could not use it. Ehud is crippled. He's chosen to go because nobody thinks he's a threat. Nobody thinks he's dangerous. Nobody thinks he can make a difference. No one thinks he can change a situation. No one thinks he could save the nation. No one thinks he could defeat the enemy. No one except him. Except him. Now you may look at your life and go, if you knew me, man, if you knew me, you'd realise there's not a lot that I can do either. There's not a lot of difference I can make. You know, I just need to get a job and earn a bit of money. That'll be fine. That'll be life solid. And actually, God's looking at you tonight and he's saying, you... Oh, you can make a difference. You, you can save a nation. Anybody out there? Anybody who thinks maybe that could be me? Anybody who looks at himself and says, really? Me? I can do that? I can change something? I can impact it? I could change this name? I could change my city? I could change my town? I could change my family? He had lots of reasons to say he couldn't do it. He had lots of great excuses. I'm I'm crippled. I can't even use this hand. Really, you've got to pick someone else. But the truth is this. The thing that had crippled him would be the reason that he could defeat the enemy. The thing that has ruined your past. The thing you think wrecked your life. The thing you think excuses you from living passionately for God will be the very thing, the very thing that God will use to defeat the enemy who tries to hold you down. God will use the stuff. He will use the stuff that everybody else points at and says, those are your failings. God will use the stuff that everybody else points at and says, this is your faults. God will use the stuff that everybody else points at and says, these are your problems. This is your issue. God specializes in using people like you and me who got all sorts of stuff wrong. Who got all sorts of things that we try and hide. Do you think Ehud wandered around with his crippled hand showing? Or do you think he kept it tucked in his jacket, in his tunic? I don't think he wanted to go around going, hey, hey everybody, look, look what's wrong with me. I mean, none of us want to do that, do we? None of us want people to know, this is my issue, this is my problem, this is what's wrong. What we want people to see is, hey, this, this is my best look. This, this, this is me on a great day. I'm showing you my great day. I'm only going to show you my great day because I want you to be impressed with me. Ehud had to bring the worst of him in order to get the best of God. If he tried to bring the best of him, he had nothing to bring. But when he brought the worst of him, the broken of him, the destroyed of him, then God could bring his stuff to make his impact and bring his change. You see, God always uses our scars to heal other people. It's our wounds. It's our problems. It's our mistakes. That God uses to heal other people. We understand that because that's how He used Jesus. It's in His wounds, it's in His scars. The disciples had to see the scars to know it was Him. Do you know what? People have got to see the real us. Not the best face. Not the I've had time to get dressed the way I wanted to get dressed and do, do my makeup, fellas, the way you wanted to do your makeup and your hair, get it just the way you wanted to do your hair. 
God needs you to be able to show people you. Because it's your failings that make you his favourite. It's your pain that makes you the one that he loves so passionately. And it's out of that that he can bring a change. You see, we use those things as excuses, but they're not. They're your CV for living for God. You, you, want to, you want to hear excuses? You want to hear excuses? Moses, Moses was a murderer. And he stammered so badly, he had to get somebody else to talk for him. And God tells him to lead a nation. Feels like God's a little unfair there, doesn't it? Noah was a drunk. He got hammered and passed out. God used him. Jacob was a liar. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Abraham, Abraham was too old to have kids. And God chose him at a hundred. And Sarah in the nineties to have kids. I mean, it just, it's wrong the more you think about it. It's just plain wrong. But God, they could have said, I have a lot of reasons, God, why you should choose someone younger. Joseph had been abused. I mean, he'd been abused by his brothers, he'd been abused as a slave, and he'd been sent to prison for rape. Well, he hadn't done it, but everybody thought he'd done it. Gideon had an inferiority complex, so massive, that when you picked him out of a crowd, he could give you ten reasons straight away why you picked the wrong person. Samson. Samson had issues. I mean, Samson had issues coming out of his issues. Samson, he's what they named the big issue after. I mean, he really is. Samson had all sorts wrong. First of all, he had long hair. I mean, that was just wrong. Hair so long, never had it cut. Never, never, never had it cut. That's ridiculous. That's an issue right there all by itself. Then you get onto Samson and women. Samson had issues. Now, he just had to see a woman and he wanted to marry her. He didn't even have to know her name. You just like, man, I want to marry that girl. Now, I know some of you guys, you've got that as well. But we can deal with that another time. Just Samson. Man, that guy had lust issues like you would not believe. Rahab was a prostitute. Why that's funny, I have no idea. Elijah was suicidal. Timothy was sick. And Lazarus had an issue. Hey, you guys are older and smarter than you being right now. <laughs> Lazarus had an issue. Lazarus was dead. If you don't have an issue of why you can't be used, being dead is a really good issue. Lazarus, I want to use you to speak to people. God, you can't do that, I'm dead. <laughs> now Lazarus, being dead is no excuse for being used by God. Let me deal with that. I'm going to bring you back from the dead. Lazarus, can you imagine? He hears his voice. Lazarus, come out! Lazarus shuffles out, kind of looks around and says, knew this was coming. God told him a dead issue didn't really count. Listen, God's not dying to you, you. He died to use you. It's whether you choose to let him use you or you choose instead to say, you know what God, I'm just going to have my issues. And my issue is going to overcome your power to use me. Because God's power to use you, when the priority of our life is fanning the flame of our issues, these are my problems, I'm going to talk to you about my problems. Let me talk to you about my problems. I've got so many problems, it's unbelievable. I have a problem where my mouth says things before my brain even reacts. I have problems coming out of my ears. I have problems. But if I live in my problems, all I'm going to do is breed more problems. But when you start to say, do you know what, God? Can you really use me despite my issues and my problems? Does it make a difference if I get in your presence? Yes, it does. Just getting in his presence starts to make a difference. Starts to make a change. Starts to transform you. What were the problems? They start to become solutions for other people. Because other people look at your life and they realize, wow, if you can get through that, then, then maybe I can get through that. you got a scar. You will not believe you've got a scar. Talk to a bunch of guys about scars. It's amazing what happens. Some guy comes in and goes, i got a scar. 
Some other guy goes, that's not a scar. I'll show you a scar. And they start to bear scars. Start to show scars. I have a pretty good scar across my back. Usually it's a winner. In the scar fight, my scar wins. It's a pretty good scar. It's about this one. It's brilliant. I got it in Manchester, city centre, guy with a knife, straight into my back. No word of warning, nothing at all. Knife in, cut across. He was a surgeon, he was doing a little operation. Um, but, but that, that's what happened. I have a great scar on my back. Talk to my dad. If my dad's in a scar conversation, my dad has some amazing scars. He had his appendix taken out in 1946. Back when they, you know, they used these massive saws to do things. Nowadays, you can take an appendix out through keyhole surgery. They go through your belly button and just pop it out again. It's amazing what they can do now. But then, they like open the whole of your body up. Like, just like, eh? And my dad has this scar here that's like unbelievably good. That's a great scar. But if someone beats that, my dad kills him every time. He goes, you think that's a scar? I'll show you a scar. And then he removes his false legs. <laughs> Rolls up his trousers and goes, that's a scar. And the hole in the bottom of his leg is a scar. Everybody that guy goes, respect. That is a great scar. You win. How do you argue with a 70 year old man with no legs and massive scars? There's no way out of that. You just lost the scar fight. My dad didn't use losing his legs as an excuse not to live his life. What's your excuse? What are you hiding behind? What reason you've got for why God can't use you to change your world? Ehud was a cripple. But he didn't let it stop him. Do you know what Ehud's surname is? He was a Benjamite. This is what his surname means. It means son of the right hand. And he's got a crippled right hand. His name laughs at him. But God was behind him. So when everybody else laughed at the name that he had, God put his weight behind him. You see, God wants to use you. But only if you'll be used. God wants to make a difference with your life. But only if you'll let your life make a difference. And this is what he'll do. He'll take the things that right now stop you and he'll use them to propel you forward. I, I was so timid growing up, I didn't talk to anybody. Incredibly shy. Just absolute fear. The, the fear of speaking in public. When we go, you know, you go around reading, around the table in primary school. I was terrified by the time it got to me. I would stammer and stutter my way through this, you know, the dog sat on the mat. mat. It was awful. Went into secondary school, felt exactly the same way. And then God says, this is what you're going to do with your life. I'm going, God, you've got the wrong person. I can't even talk in front of my class, let alone in front of hundreds and thousands of people. God, you, you made a mistake. And then God says, let me teach you about the Bible. The Bible tells you what's true. You're just dealing with a piece of fact. You may have the facts of your past, but you need the truth of the Bible. And the truth of the Bible overrides the facts of your past. So God started to teach me, I started to read verses like this. 1 Corinthians 12, 24, God has combined the members of the body and gives greater honor to the parts that lacked it. 1 Corinthians 1, 27, God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And he started saying, I can use you. I can use your issues, I can use your problems, I can use your challenges, I can use you. You meet my wife, she's a counsellor, she's like really lovely, every meet she's like, isn't she lovely? Yeah, she is. She's married to me. <laughs> hey, isn't, isn't she amazing? She is amazing. You, know, you could talk to her for hours, yeah you could, but you need to read her school reports, they're incredible. Julie's school reports read a little bit like this, might read like this, Stuart is a pleasure to teach, his maturity lifts the level of the class. It actually says that on my school report. It's amazing. No one believes his mind. They think it's a fake. My wife says this. I, the teacher writes, English teacher, I think Julie hates me. I'm afraid she may try and kill me. School report. 
give it to her parents. Her dad's a senior policeman. He is not happy. Next school report. Same, same year. Go around. Same year. Julie has not been to my class this year. I have nothing to say. <laughs> I know parents, obviously, now. I try to imagine how they responded in that moment. Probably not good. So, when you ask my wife what she was doing between the ages of 12 and 17, she doesn't have much recollection. I mean, she has an idea of it. She remembers the days when she would spend in the crack house taking the drugs and whatever else came with it. She remembers the time when she was in the school toilet and a girl upset her so much she banged her head against the sink until her head bled. She remembers the day that she got a stiletto heel off her foot because it was the 80s. And she beat the girl in the head with it because of the way she looked to it. She remembers those days. She also remembers this day when someone came into school and talked about Jesus. She remembers sitting there and thinking these words to herself. Why didn't no one tell me about this before? Why didn't no one tell me someone had died for me? Someone loved me? Someone believed in me? Why, why didn't no one do this? She remembers being 17 and giving her life to Jesus, never having been to church. So she went and found the nearest church. Just walked in and said, I think I've just found God. And um, I need my life to change. What do I do now? And some really good people. Just got a hold of her life. So today, what's she doing with her life? She sits and talks and listens to people whose lives are as messed up as hers was. And she brings them life. What's your issues? What are the challenges? What are the problems? Because they will be the way that God will use you to transform other people's lives, to bring a change to them. I'm about done. I'm going to pray in a moment. But you've got to make a choice. You've got to choose this. God, am I going to live with my issues? Or am I going to live in what you say? God, did you use the weak and the broken? Or do you use the things that society casts aside? You use the failures, you use the drunks, liars, you use the murderers, you use those people because it makes you look good, God. And God wants to look good through you and he wants to use you, but will you let him use you? Will you actually give him your life so completely that your issues are not the issue? Is what could God do with me that becomes the important thing? And if you let it, who knows where it'll take you? Who knows what it'll mean? Ehud started the day as an unknown delivery boy with a crippled hand. He ended the day leading the army, defeating the enemy, still crippled but now known, and now in a position to make a difference. When you close your eyes for a moment, we're going to pray. God wants to challenge you. He wants to challenge you. Because he doesn't want you to live hiding behind your issues. He wants you to live being who he's called you to be. So right now you have the choice. You can say my issues, man, I, I got them. If you knew me, I got those. If you knew what was wrong with me, if you knew what was broken in me, if you knew my past, if you knew the things that I've done, if you knew that, you'd be saying, God can't use me. Let me tell you, God can use you. So whether you let it's whether you let him. It's whether you let him get in. 
So whether you let him take a hold of those scars that are on your life, just change them into trophies. But right now, it's your choice. Just a moment, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to respond. I'm gonna ask you to make a response where you you have to do something, not just do one of those I'll respond when I get home moments, but actually do something. I'm gonna say, God use me. God, would you use me? Guys, I realize there's a lot of people moving, but if you could just close your eyes for a sec, that'd help you.